9, please. Matthew 9. When we were last in Matthew together, we found our Lord at Gadara on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And uh, there confronting the powers of darkness, the servants of the prince of the power of the air who had come to possess the man whom Jesus freed by his power over the forces of evil. It was, you may remember, immediately after the boat ride that Jesus took across the sea from the western shore to the east that the conflict at Gadara took place, and the people there immediately invited Jesus to leave. And so, as we pick up today, we find Jesus getting back into the boat, heading back to the western shore, to the home base of his Galilean ministry. But uh, before we get to the text and back across the sea, it is worth noting that we have no record of Jesus ever having returned to that place again after he was rejected and sent away by them. That is a dismal reality and one worth pondering for a moment today. When Jesus comes to you, you must not send him away. When he knocks at the door of your heart, it is time to open and receive him. He does not tarry long where he is not welcome. Don't trifle with Jesus. Don't send him away. He may never come again. On the other hand, we also see the mercy of Jesus as we look over our shoulder, and as Jesus looks over his shoulder too, crossing the sea, because we see that Jesus left for himself a testimony there in Gadara. He left that formerly demon-possessed man behind as a witness of his work, a missionary of sort to the fellow Gentiles there to tell them what God had done for him. Now Matthew says Jesus goes back to his own city. Well, what city is that? Well, it's not Nazareth, uh, the place where he grew up. It's not Nazareth, but rather, as you know, Capernaum, the base of his earthly uh, of his ministry operations in Galilee that Matthew calls the Lord's own city and there he continues his miraculous work as Matthew continues now to give us a sampling of the Lord's works in chapters 8 and 9 after having given us that marvelous specimen of the Lord's words in Matthew 5 through 7 the sermon on the mount let's pray Father, as we return to your word, we once again acknowledge, own our absolute dependence upon your Holy Spirit for him to do a great work and for his presence, for his illumination on these words that he himself inspired. We humbly pray, speak for your servants are listening. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, Then he said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowds saw it, they were afraid. 
And they glorified God who had given such authority to men. Well, no wonder the the crowds thronged around Jesus. They had never seen anything like this before. News about him spread far and wide among believers, would-be believers, and non-believers alike. You know, were anyone doing things like this in America today, it would be on the front page of the New York Times. It would be in every newspaper and on the evening news. People would throng around such a person today for the same reasons. Some noble, many not so much. Jesus had attracted attention all the way down from Jerusalem, from which the religious leaders sent now a delegation of Pharisees and teachers of the law to investigate. You know, can't have any false teachers running around after all, right? And, and this Jesus had not been accredited by them. And he hadn't met their stamp of approval as a rabbi. They went with critical intent. And what they met with in Jesus that day was more than even they might have anticipated. They were in that crowd that was so thick that day in and around the house, we imagine it might have been Peter's own house, that four loyal friends who were friends in need and therefore friends indeed could not get their paralyzed comrade into Jesus, into the house for Jesus to heal. But where there is a will, there is a way. Matthew doesn't give us the details. We get them from Mark and and Luke. But at no small difficulty to themselves, they managed to get their friend on his bed, onto the roof, break somehow through all of the roofing material. This is no small feat. Probably, I imagine, cock the bed to, to fit it in just right. Their friend probably tied to it so that it would fit through the hole and they could maneuver it down by ropes and dangle him before Jesus. He sees their faith. But strikingly, instead of saying to the paralytic, you are healed, he says, you are forgiven. Can you imagine how the crowd must have gasped at that? You know, what did he say? Did, you, did, you, did I hear him right? Yes, he said it. He said, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven you. Really? Now, the import of his statement would not be lost on them, and especially not on the scribes and the Pharisees who knew instantly what this was. Blasphemy! The simple syllogism in their hearts and minds went something like this. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus is claiming to forgive sins. QED, Jesus is claiming to be God. And that is blasphemy. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, asks, Why do you think evil in your hearts? He said to them, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? Of course, either either of those things is easy enough to say, right? Anyone can say either of those. It's easy to say, your sins are forgiven, but of course, difficult to prove. Because forgiveness of sin is not necessarily a visible phenomenon, is it? it? It happens in heaven. But to say, rise and walk to a paralytic, and then to see him do just that, now that would be something. That would be something to see indeed. Jesus intends to prove the truth of the former by demonstration with the latter. Verse 6, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he says to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. How wonderfully symmetrical is the result to the command, isn't it? He rose, he went home. 
We've already made the point in this series in Matthew that Jesus did not perform miracles simply for the sake of performing miracles. He didn't even perform them primarily for the sake of making people better from their diseases. Although wonderfully they did and he did. We'll be singing this season with great joy. He comes to make his blessings flow where'er the curse is found. But there was always a greater mission, a greater meaning, a greater purpose which was served by the miracles. It isn't very difficult to see that purpose behind these miracles because Jesus has been gradually making, them, making it more and more plain. Cast our minds back to the beginning of the last chapter and the cleansing of the leprous man. There the healing declaration was what? Do you remember? Be clean. Then to the Roman centurion who came to Jesus on behalf of his paralyzed servant, Jesus gave not only healing but salvation, a place at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But now all the subtlety disappears and the nub of the matter is brought into full light. Jesus says it plainly, your sins are forgiven. The miracles are deliberately made a picture by Jesus, a picture of salvation. Even this early in his ministry, Jesus is showing not only by words but by deeds what it means to be saved. How one is made right with God, given a new life, granted salvation. Which brings me to the first point. My friends, what we need the most above everything else, our supreme deficit that must be filled is that of forgiveness. More than anything else in the world, what we and every human being needs the most is to be forgiven. What do you need the most is the question, and people give all sorts of answers, don't they? I need more money. I need a better job. I need a better education. You know, I need a, I need a better education to get more money to get a better job. I, I need a better girlfriend. I need a bigger house. I need a a better environment. If only my environment were different, then everything else would be, you know, how, they, how all of that goes. We, we have all sorts of ideas about what we need. When we're sick, we need to get well. When we're hurt, we need healing and so on. But Jesus knows what people really need. What they truly lack. And what we absolutely cannot live without. We must have our sins forgiven. And you know this, don't you? You know this when you're thinking most clearly that your biggest problem, that the central, the core problem of your life is your sin. Now, most of the time, or much of the time, we're distracted from this terrible reality. Only from time to time we're brought to the realization that we have been sinning every single day all day of our lives, breaking God's law as we breathe. Sometimes the thought of your sin is to you nearly crushing, isn't it? The ways you've disobeyed, the ways you've disappointed God, grieved the Spirit, brings you to tears. You consider your failures. And then, then you know what you so desperately need. To have those sins paid for. To have them taken away. To be, in a word, forgiven. That's what Jesus came to do. That is what Jesus came to do. This has been the point from the very beginning of Matthew's gospel. Remember all the way back in chapter 1, the angel comes to Joseph, tells Joseph in a dream about what's happening with Mary's betrothed. She would bear a son, and you shall call his name 
Yes, Jesus. You shall call his name Jesus. Why? It's got a kind of ring to it, right? Jesus? Why? For he will save his people, yes, from their sins. And what that would require of him. Oh my. Back to the house of Capernaum. What was the harder of the two things to say? Rise and walk. It required no real effort on Jesus' part. But your sins are forgiven. That would require untold, unmeasured, unmeasurable effort and sacrifice from Jesus and from the Father and from the Holy Spirit. For him to say, your sins are forgiven, required him to go to the cross. That he bear those sins and carry them in himself under all of the wrath of God for those sins and suffer every ounce of their punishment. Of your punishment. All the suffering of the pit of hell he would undergo to say to even one sinner, your sins are forgiven. And that's just what he did. Just exactly what he did. In the place not only of one sinner, but of an unnumbered multitude of sinners. Including you. And me. You may think perhaps your greatest need is just a little more money, you know, than, than you'd have it, or, or some better friends, or even healing from whatever disease it is that you're suffering right now. No, it's not. Your greatest need is to have your sins forgiven and washed away. Money will disappear. Friends, they'll disappoint even life eventually will be demanded from your body you don't need those things but the rest of eternity follows after this life what you need to use the leper's phrase is to be made clean You need to have your sins washed away and to be made right with God. Which brings me to the second point. What you need the most, forgiveness of your sin, only one person can give you, and that person is Jesus Christ. You've sinned against God, like David says in the Psalms, against you, you only have I sinned. Jesus Christ is the one who is able to give you the forgiveness of sin. And that for a couple of reasons. First, Because he is God. The Pharisees and the scribes that day in that city, the region of Galilee, they had eyes sharp as a lynx when it came to spotting faults. But they were blind as bats when it came to spotting truth. They were ready. They were just ready and waiting for Jesus to slip up somehow. But they got so much more than even they had bargained for when they heard him say... Your sins are forgiven. That to their minds was the ultimate blasphemy. They knew what Jesus was saying, what Jesus was claiming for himself. He was saying that he is God. It would have been blasphemy indeed, wouldn't it have been, if it were not for the fact, the simple and uncomplicated reason that he is God. God the son back to chapter one the angel tells joseph that the son will be named jesus and that name jesus you remember is simply the english version of the greek version of the hebrew name that we know in english as joshua in hebrew yeshua in greek jesus in english joshua or jesus it means quite literally Jehovah is salvation. You see, Jesus is not just his name. 
It's his identity, and it is his mission. Jesus Christ has come to save, to bring salvation, to save his people from their sin. Notice that word, that possessive pronoun passed by so quickly, his. He will save his people from their sin. What has the angel just done? He's just identified Jesus with Yahweh as Yahweh, the Lord, Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, who the psalmist says will redeem Israel from all their sins. God saves his people. And as it had always been expected from of old, God would do this by coming himself as the Messiah to accomplish that salvation. So the person in Mary's womb, according to the angels, reckoning is divine. The divine Messiah, the one who's been promised from the very beginning of Israel's history. In fact, even before that, back in the Garden of Eden. And the work that this person does is the work of salvation. Jesus is God. And God has come to save us. That's why Matthew dropped the prophecy of Isaiah right there in the angels, after the angel's message. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. What children, what does, children, what does Emmanuel mean? Emmanuel means what? God with us. God with us. And as such, he's the only one in all of the history of the world who can forgive your sin. Only God, the God against whom we have offended by our sin, can also take away those sins, can make provision for them as he did on the cross, and so consequently forgive them. And this he is willing. No. More than that, this he is pleased and glad to do. For you. Because second, he is compassionate. Did you notice the way he addresses this man, this paralytic man, just before forgiving his sin? My son. Verse 2, take heart, my son. Your sins are forgiven. Do you hear the tenderness, the compassion that Jesus has for us sinners? Might he not justly have addressed any of us as you slob, you slut, you scum, you sinner, and been perfectly accurate? But no. He comes to you and he says, My son, my dear daughter, he is compassionate and gracious. Just as he explained to Moses on that glorious day, remember the words, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abundant bounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Who appeared to Moses that day? Give it a little thought. It was Jesus. It was Jesus. It was Yeshua, Yahweh, the Lord who appeared to Moses. So compassionate is he. Remember at the repulsive sight of the leper in the last chapter of Matthew, he doesn't recoil, does he, like everybody else around him, but just the opposite. Moved with compassion, the text says, he reaches out and he touches him. 
fact is, if any of us could see ourselves for what we are, if we could, like the literary character Dorian Gray, if you're familiar with that story, you could look upon a portrait of yourself in your sin, could perceive even a fraction of the monstrosity of your own reflection in the spiritual mirror, the pictures of the twisted, half-melted faces and mangling, mangled, fingerless hands of lepers would seem to you quite mild by comparison. But Jesus reaches out to touch you, just as he did that leper, scabrous, filthy, in your sin, Jesus, God, the Son, the pure, the holy, the compassionate one with his healing, his loving touch, takes all your sin away and leaves you clean like a, a positive infection. Isn't that a nice thought in these days? a positive infection that we get from Jesus. He invades our uncleanness and makes us clean. Here's John Calvin. There is such purity in Christ. He absorbs all uncleanness and pollution. He does not contaminate himself by touching the leper, nor does he transgress the law. He stays whole, clears our dirt away, and pours upon us his own holiness. Now, while he could heal the leper by his word alone, he adds the contact of his hand to show his feeling of compassion. No wonder, since he willed to put on our flesh in order that he might cleanse us from all our sins. Here is a thing which we pass over without much impression at an idle reading, but must certainly ponder with much awe when we take it properly that the Son of God, so far from abhorring contact with the leper, actually stretched out his hand to touch his uncleanness. Dear flock, he still reaches out his hand to touch, to restore you. He has the cure for your deadly disease of sin. What healing do you need? What, what sin still troubles your conscience? What sorrow still grieves your soul? What makes you anxious? What makes you weary? What makes you sad? Jesus stands ready to touch your hurting places and to make you whole again. And with a word, with his authoritative word, as God the Son, as in the case of the paralytic, he declares, your sins are forgiven. Now here's the thing. You must come to him. You must come. But you're embarrassed to come, you say. For whatever reason, you're just too embarrassed. Or maybe you're just too proud to come. Or too independent to come. What will other people think after all? You know, it's too much trouble to come. Remember those people Jesus told us about not long ago in Matthew? You know, I'll come after, you know. When I've done that, then I'll come after I've handled this, but it's just too inconvenient right now. Imagine, imagine for a moment that the leper had decided that facing the stares and the jeers and the, uh, the repulsed looks of the town folk was just too much to bear, too much to come to Jesus. How tragically his life would have gone. How he would have died in his leprosy. And his sin, he had to come. He had to come. Nothing could stop him. He must see Jesus. He must hear Jesus' healing word. He must 
dare he even begin to imagine such a thing in his wildest dreams. He must feel the touch of Jesus. Unclean, unclean, he cries out to the crowd because he's, he knows there's only one who can make him clean. Imagine if those four friends of the paralytic had decided on the porch of the house in Capernaum that, you know what, we, we just can't get in. You know, the house is just too full. And turn back. Too many people. We can't, we, we can't see Jesus. Imagine if they had not climbed those stairs and dug with their fingernails into that roof until finally peeling away that all of that material could see Jesus below. Imagine if they had halted along the way because tearing that hole in the roof would, would earn them the, the ridicule and the, the hatred, the anger, the scorn of those below on whom the pieces of the roof are falling in the house, looking up and glaring at them. Oh, well, they say that they're paralyzed, friend. You know, we gave it a college try, right? No walking, no feeling, no running, no jumping, no healing, no forgiveness. But they didn't give up. They were determined to encounter Jesus. More specifically, they were determined that their friend should encounter Jesus and be healed. Find yourself in them, would you? Find yourself in them, my friends. Find yourself in that determined leper and don't you give up. See how infinitely important, more important than anything else in all creation, salvation must be to you until your entire life comes to revolve around it. Make it the calling of your life to obtain that salvation for yourself and for all those whom you love for yourself for your children. Feel your own desperation for cleansing, for healing, for being raised out of your death, for that is what we are. The Bible says in our sins and trespasses, we were dead, says Paul, until the Savior touch you and say that over you. Your sins are forgiven and give you new life. Tell him that unless he save you, you can't be saved. Tell him that if you die apart from him, it will not be because you did not press hard against the crowds, because you did not climb the roof and tear a hole in it with your bare hands to get to him if that is what you need to do. Tell him that it will not be because you were unwilling to be lowered by your friends by ropes from the ceiling if that's what it took to have your sins forgiven. Because if you will, if you will pursue him with all of your heart, you will discover what these men learned and a multitude of people have since, that the Lord never turns away those who come believingly to him. Never once, not, not once in all of his ministry did he turn away a single person who came to him with that sort of intrepid faith. Indeed, he's, indeed, he said of all such men and women, boys and girls, that you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Amen.